This is A Word Fitly Spoken. By words about reading the scriptures, about preaching the scriptures, and about the mission on which the scripture sends all of us, we here at A Word Fitly Spoken aim to give you, the servant of Christ, more and more always from the fullness the Lord has given us in His Holy Word. I'm Willie Grills here with Zell and Heidi today to talk about the Acts of the Apostles. An important book, wouldn't you say, Zellwin? Oh, a very important book. It's not just a matter of recording what happened in the early church, but it's also something that tells us about what the church should be doing today, prescriptive as well as descriptive, or would you disagree with that? No, I absolutely agree. I mean, we want to imitate those who have gone before us. Uh, We see both positive and negative examples in Acts. We see lovely pictures of pastoral sacrifice in uh, St. Paul and St. Peter, I mean, and the other disciples like Stephen, you know, his martyrdom is certainly an example. Uh, we see some very negative examples, things you ought not do, like Ananias and Sapphira or Simon Magus. Uh, so there, there's a lot going on here. And Acts is a book that's read often kind of like an adventure story or just kind of like mere history. Like it's not really informative. Like it's nice that we have it and we know what to do, but does it really speak to the church today? We trot it out for Ascension and Pentecost, and then do we even read it at any point in the lectionary after that? I'm not even sure. (laughs) Right, right. And it's a book that is used often in broader evangelicalism and in Christian primitivism and in uh, restorationist Christianity. People who would open up Acts and say, hey, we're going to do things exactly how it was done in the book of Acts. We end up with some problems there, obviously. You know, Acts is not a book that you want to read apart from the rest of the Bible or apart from its historical context. Now, that's true for any book. But the pastoral epistles inform Acts. The Gospel of Luke certainly informs Acts for obvious reasons. And well, I guess we should tell the, the audience what that obvious reason would be. The author of the book of Acts is the Gospel writer Luke. And he is the one who wrote these two as a, a two-part book to be given to especially one called Theophilus. And so Luke's purpose in writing this book is not merely to just recount history, because that's a, an understanding of history that I think is very modern. We read history books so that we can find out what happened. But Luke is writing for a very specific reason, and he wants to emphasize that as the church is going and growing and going out into the world, that it is God who is doing all of these things. So yeah, so we don't want to think of it as a, how would you say, a a primitivist blueprint for the church today in the sense that we can just copy everything, you know, copy and paste and call it good. But we should think of it in terms of what is God doing in his church? Because that is going to inform what it is that God wants for us to do now. Right, right. Very important. You, you get the beginnings of the church immediately after Jesus' ascension. Not that that's the beginnings of the church, but I mean, the church, the, the book picks up right after, or really during the ascension. And then the bulk of the story is what happens after Pentecost and beyond. We occupy the same epoch that the uh, the original audience of Acts occupied. That is, Christ has ascended, he is reigning on his throne, and the Holy Spirit has descended to the church. That's the time we live in, too. So while there are very many things in Acts that are going to be different and very foreign to us, and I think for most of us it's going to be the debate about food laws you know, not drinking blood or eating anything strangled, that's meat sacrifice idols, that sort of thing. We live in a very uh, similar era, and we receive the same Holy Spirit that the people in Acts receive. And we serve, worship, and obey the same Lord who sits at the right hand of God, the same Lord Jesus Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father. And so we're part of that continuing story of the church. So this is very important for us. You should never forget your history and never forget your fathers. And you should honor your fathers and those who came before you. And our fathers are here in Acts. It would behoove us to to take a look at the text, to read the text, and to learn from it. Because beyond that, it's not merely the record of our fathers in the faith. It's the voice of the Holy Spirit in these inspired words. Absolutely. And it actually, as you mentioned, begins with at the ascension when Jesus is going up into heaven to sit down at the right hand of God. 
And I think that's an important consideration here to remember is Acts is not the account of Jesus leaving and then everyone trying to figure everything out. Acts is actually Christ being with his church, Christ working in his church uh, through the working of the Holy Spirit and to bring about that growth and that increase, which he is still continuing today. And so this isn't a case of Jesus has disappeared. This is a case of Jesus has is now reigning in power and authority to extend that reign out into the world. And so this is the very beginning of the church and the, the game plan to right. spread the gospel into the world. And another important point, uh, this is the fulfillment of the words of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is coming. Um, and even the words of you know John the Baptist. These are this is what was prophesied to occur. The events in Acts are, are even more proof of the validity of the Christian faith. The scriptures testify to that. The scriptures are our ultimate authority, which attest to these things. It's not as if the guys here, you know. So so we're in chapter one talking about the ascension, and then so now they've got a shortage of apostles, right? So Matthias is then chosen. Uh, they cast lots. And Matthias is chosen as the next apostle. And then what happens, Zelwyn? Well, then we very, very importantly have Pentecost, the coming yeah. of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. And they're all kind of hanging out. You know, they're waiting. And that's always kind of the butt of jokes, right? What were they waiting on? Did they did they, did they expect anything? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that they knew exactly how the Holy Spirit was going to manifest? Or do you think there's some measure of surprise here? I think they're surprised to some degree, but I do think that they're waiting because, you know, they're they're actually starting to listen to Jesus when he told them to wait, as opposed to, you know, they didn't believe anything prior to his resurrection. But now that he is uh, resurrected and gone up into heaven, I think they're starting to, to get it a little bit. But the, the coming of the Holy Spirit, I think, took them a little bit by surprise, but in a good way. It's not so much for their reassurance that we have this. Because the, the working of the Holy Spirit wouldn't need these external signs, but I think it's actually for our reassurance that we know that the Holy Spirit is is working in the church. The signs aren't given to convince those who are in the house, because actually the signs just confuse everybody outside. But it's the signs combined with Peter's preaching that actually begins the the great events at Pentecost. Yeah, so let's talk about that then. Chapter 2, then the first sign is what? Well, the the, the wind, the, the rushing wind. Yeah, oh, yeah, we can say that too. Yeah, the wind, the tongues of fire, but the first manifestation that the public's going to experience. Oh, I, I get you. Uh, the, the speaking in tongues, the speaking yeah. in other human languages. Yeah, oh, look at that. Now, you already went very specific, and we could go on <laughs> for a whole podcast about this, but that's what we want to do. They are speaking in known languages. It's very clear from this context. Do we want to read that? I mean, it goes through all the, the nationalities that are there and every man's hearing in his own tongue. Yeah, and I think I think you can kind of summarize it up by saying that what they're hearing is various forms of Greek, various forms of Aramaic, uh, some Latin is thrown in there, probably some Coptic languages down in Northern Africa. The point is, is that all of these Jews who have been gathered together into the church are now hearing the apostles preaching proclaiming the the good works of God, but they don't actually understand it. They're confused. And so that's why Peter gets up and he actually starts a preaching. Yeah, well, you know, and you have both going on. You have people kind of marveling at this, but then you also have the scoffers who are saying that they're drunk. And that's I've always found that text to be very interesting, that they would hear this and then immediately accuse them of being drunk. If I have a couple cocktails, it doesn't necessarily improve my English, let alone my Spanish. And, <laughs> and so... I've always wondered like why that was an objection. And really, though, it, it shows two things here, that hearing is not only the sound waves going into your ears. There's the hearing of faith. There's the, the ears that, that have to be opened for you to understand these things. So that even when you see a miracle, I mean, a miracle is actually manifested. And even if you didn't understand it as a miracle, it would surely be something odd and spectacular. You would still sit there and scoff because you've not been given ears to hear, as it were. Yeah, their hearts were hardened. Yeah, and again, Jesus says this is all going to come. And he talks about the the, the way the Spirit works, which we've glossed over a little bit here. Um, so let's back up a little bit. So you, ha you have the tongues. Okay, then you have the wind, which is very significant, the sound of a rushing wind. Uh, why would that be significant uh, with regard to the Holy Spirit? Well, I mean, the Spirit is associated with the wind. It's a manifestation of the Spirit. Like it, that wind starts there, and then and then here is... 
uh, it's vivid and it would have been much more evident to the to the original audience i think the spirit is wind jesus talking about the spirit being like the wind the spirit being wind at the blows creation. wherever he lives yeah it. and blows really yeah so you have all this i mean it's it's so rich but acts moves at such a brisk pace not unlike our podcast that we can often miss these little things so you have that you have this sound like a rushing like a rushing wind it says a sound like and then you have the flaming tongues which it's really hard to find great Christian art depicting Pentecost. I don't know if you ha- ever had this issue um, when you're trying to prepare church bulletins or anything like that or announcements. <laughs> oh, I do. Yeah, no, it, it you usually get something that's either really tacky or just doesn't work well in like clip art type form. So exactly, and it would seem that the flaming tongues are a unique manifestation. I think it is important that when we're talking about the miracle at Pentecost, that we also point out, like I was saying, Peter's preaching. Because ultimately, it's Peter who is proclaiming that, you know, in the last days, God declares that I will pour my spirit in all flesh. This is prophesied from of old. And then he says, you know, you are the ones who have crucified Jesus. You are the ones who have put him to death, just as was foretold. But you can now turn and repent and believe and be saved. Yeah, and it's 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 fascinating, too. Peter preaches the text, I mean, quite literally preaches the text of Joel, you know, quotes it directly and then uses it to call these men to repentance and saying mm-hmm. the time is at hand. It, it is it is significant. It, it, it's a blueprint for a sermon. Peter has a text in mind. Peter uses the text. <laughs> I, mean, <it's, laughs> I, I do like but, an ancient ancient sermons are always very interesting to read. And biblical ones are, are especially important. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the reason why I'm hammering on this so much is because when we look at the miracles that are going on in Acts, yes, they are important, but we don't necessarily have we don't have to look for them today to know that the Holy Spirit is still working among us. Right. When the Holy Spirit uh, proclaims His word, and we know when we hear something like preaching, we know that the Spirit is there, and that's what you know He's trying to teach us here in Acts. He's, you see this powerful sign of Him working among the people, and then you also see Him actually converting through Peter's preaching. And so when we go out into the world today and proclaim Christ, we don't have to have a mini Pentecost every time we evangelize so that we start speaking in tongues or something like that. You know, God can do what he wants, of course. But we know that when we proclaim the word just as Peter did, that God will do what he chooses to do, that he will work faith when and where he pleases. And the vividness of Peter's sermon and the directness is, is amazing. So we'll like Acts two thirty eight and following. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Another important thing to remember. Yeah, we're probably not going to convert 3,000 people in an average sermon. (laughs) Maybe. Might get close, but no. This is where I think we as preachers could learn something, too. The sermon has become, you know, something of a sacred cow. And and by by that I mean I mean two things to kind of butcher the idiom there. We have made the sermon into something it was not intended to be. And so therefore our audience kind of expects a sermon to be something different than what may, perhaps the Bible expects it to be. We're we're taught to be kind of clever, and Paul's clever as we're going to see, but in a different way. But this kind of direct preaching would probably get you ran out of a many a congregation. It doesn't have to be Lutheran, I'm not saying I'm saying any any Christian pulpit might not cater or might not cotton to this too well, but it is so clear. I mean, I mean, what, but what is the lesson here that, that the proclamation of the gospel is meant to be clear and direct, and you're actually speaking to people? You know, this Jesus Christ, whom you crucified. Okay, repent and believe, each and every one of you. Repent and be baptized, so that even those who killed Christ could still find salvation. Right. I mean, that's that's basically what we're getting at here. Yeah, and if we want to talk about law gospel, there's your specific law and your specific gospel preached. This is what you did. Now here is the remedy. And the, and the, and many of them do believe. 
And they do believe. I mean, that's the thing. Like, that's the that's the thing. Are we confident in the Spirit working through preaching? Because this is what happens here. It's not Peter's eloquence that converts these people, but the Spirit working through those words that he is giving. And then that day, about 3,000 are added. A tremendous, tremendous. Uh, and, and you don't see this often. You don't see mass conversions very often throughout history. And yet you have several, you know, you have several examples in the scriptures. At the end of the day, Acts is a testimony to the power of the Holy Spirit to change hearts and minds. And it's a testimony to the efficacy of the preached word. Well, and I mean, and maybe the the best way to emphasize that would be the very end of Acts 2, uh, just to kind of keep moving here. Uh, And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Right. It's not the apostles and Peter's superb preaching, which is somehow doing all of this work. No, what it is, is God working through Peter and his preaching and the Holy Spirit working in his church to actually make these mass conversions. And we'll come back in future episodes and unpack uh, a lot of these things. I'm sure everyone's asking, you know, what, what does he mean being saved? Does that mean we're not we're not saved right now? Uh, well, you know, and that kind of thing. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to it, folks. Don't worry. But yeah, it is the Lord doing that. And then day by day, they're attending temple together, breaking bread in their homes, receiving their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. I backed up a little bit there. But what do you have there? The Lord is continually adding to the church, and the church is living like the church. And what what does the church look like here in Acts? And you're going to see this over and over again. Going to the temple, breaking bread, praying, devoting themselves to it. What does that mean? Well, that they are, that they're diligent in it. And especially in a, in a culture which is not Christian at the time, I mean, where the church is literally, in this case, 3,000 people in the entire world that believe in, in Jesus, they are still being diligent in uh, the means of grace, uh, being diligent in prayer, being diligent in the word and hearing all of these things and doing all of it together. Together, yeah. It's it's not an individual thing. I mean, yeah, your, your piety is individual, but... It's a communal uh, understanding of the church. That's what the church is supposed to be. We have become so isolated. You know, I mean, it's a cliche to say, but we have become overly individualistic and, and isolated. And the church then tries to be all things to all people, and she just can't be that. The church ought to be what decides how we should live and how we should how we should act, or at least uh, in forms. We'll put it that. We'll put a better construction on it. And so what does it mean? They're living together. They're breaking bread. Take whatever interpretation you want on that one. But it's a picture of fellowship and a picture of unity within the body of Christ. Pictured here beautifully and very rarely lived out in certain quarters. Even even in the book of Acts, you're going to start to see division very quickly. And in the pastoral epistles, you're going to see them too. That although we see this beautiful picture that people are coming together, doing their best to live their lives as God would have them in community with their fellow brothers and sisters, with their fellow brethren. Yet, even in the early church, the devil is prowling around and sowing division. And so, in many ways, the the early church appears very different from us. And in many ways, she appears very similar. But again, what is the, what is the lesson here? that we ought to come together with one another. When we come to church, we are worshiping God together. We are praising God with one voice, and we are receiving together what God would give us. Yes, you receive the forgiveness of sins and the strengthening of faith individually, but you receive it in the company, in the true fellowship of your brothers around you. It's pictured beautifully at the communion rail, everyone coming up together, bowing together, receiving that sacrament together. And all of these little liturgical flourishes we have are often lost. That's what they're meant to express, the unity that we have in the body of Christ. Or counterpoint, Z, what do you think? No, I, th- I think you're, you're right on point that Acts is also showing and teaching us that, you know, we can't be Christians in isolation. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. And the body walks together and well, and receives the the sacraments together. And so that as we move forward now in Acts a little bit, we're going to see not only that being strengthened, but as you said, that being tested. Right. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We're going to look at conflicts with the Jews and much more right here on A Word Fitly Spoken.
If you like what you're hearing and want more, visit us at wordfitlyspoken.org. There you'll find our blog with lots of interesting articles, exegesis, sermon prep, and history. www.wordfitlyspoken.org You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. Willie Grills, Zelwyn Heidi here, talking about the Acts of the Apostles. Talking about the beginnings of the church and what did the church look like, you know, at this time. I guess I should stop saying beginnings of the church because that's really a loaded phrase, right? I mean, certainly there, the church exists before that, so don't, yeah, we don't, uh, we don't we get the wrong mean. idea. Right, right. I'm using shorthand here, folks. Have some charity. Put the best construction on it. Explain everything in the kindest way. <laughs> anyway, so now we've come to chapter four. Zell, you want to give us a quick rundown of chapter four? There were some miracles going on in chapter three, some additional confirmation of the message uh, where Peter is actually starting to work miracles. And then the Jews, the Sadducees, and probably the Pharisees a little bit, don't like what's going on. And so our friends Annas and Caiaphas basically take John and Peter into custody and start to question them about what they're doing. But I think it's interesting because even though they're trying to get them to stop preaching the resurrection of Christ, to stop actually preaching in the name of Jesus, they're not able to. The The message still goes out. The, the, the best that they're, they're able to do, and this is towards the uh, middle of chapter four, is to say, well, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, we don't want you to do this, but ultimately they don't have a say in the matter because it is this is of God and not of man. Right. This was expected to happen. He came unto his own and his own knew him not. The Jews here should have known better because they have something that the Gentiles do not. The Jews have the scripture. The Jews have the word of God, which clearly spelled out the Messiah, Christ is the Savior for the world. They've seen now the miracles of Jesus. They've seen the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension. They've seen the descension of the Holy Spirit. They've seen the miracles performed by the apostles, and they still persist in their unbelief and persecution of the church, as we're going to see in Acts. Terrible, terrible persecution of believers. Well, and I think this is worth pointing out, too, because sometimes uh, these days, like I know there's a, a popular uh, t uh, television series on the New Testament that's basically telling the story of Acts, and they, they try to present it as, as though the, the Romans are also equally opposed to the message. Well, yes, the Romans do eventually start persecuting Christians, but at this point, the opposition does not really come from the Gentiles. Opposition is primarily coming from the Jews. And so this is why Paul later, and we'll get to Paul in a little bit, is saying that he has to basically turn aside from Israel and to go to the Gentiles. And maybe the reason why we try to emphasize that so much is because the gospel of Jesus is not just meant for a particular group, you know, meant just for Israel according to the flesh. But Acts is also about the gospel going out into the whole world and the, the apostles and following the apostles as they begin to realize that. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. But the, the gospel is not just a, a particular thing, but a, a universal thing. And the apostles and the, and the Christians here expect persecution. And what do they do in the face of persecution? And this is, say, Acts 4.23 and following. They don't take up arms necessarily. You know, it's not like the would be the false Jewish messiahs who attempt, who would attempt revolution before and after. The Christians in the face of the violence of these people lift their voices to God and pray for boldness and pray for strength in the face of great persecution. And they get that strength. And that's right. good. And that's important for us too. That even right. as we struggle with, well, a, a hostile culture uh, nowadays, we know that the Holy Spirit will strengthen us as well. Right. And so we can we can learn from their example about what it means to to stand up to intense pressure. I mean, think about think about what Peter and John would have had to have faced to stand right. up before 
the high priest and say, no, we're going to still do this? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And the high priest, is it isn't like going to your local rabbi or something or, you know, going to the civil magistrate, you know, in small town America somewhere. This is a significant audience that you have. And this man wields a tremendous amount of power. He could snuff you out just like that if you wanted to. And they go before him confessing the truth because they can do no other. So moving on to Acts, um, more Acts. Um, then you have the references, uh, you know, of, of everybody holding things in common, which is just another um, example of Christian unity. Apologies to the Bernie bros, but it probably doesn't mean what you think it means. <laughs> but you do start to see uh, in this image of people sharing things in common, again, this communal atmosphere, but also this distinctive characteristic of the Christian that will define him in contrast to the pagan, and that is charity and love for one another and a care for the widow and the orphan and, and the poor. Uh, that's a theme that you really cannot escape in Acts or in the pastoral epistles for that matter. So you have a beautiful contrast here then between Barnabas. Well, I, wouldn't, I don't know if it's beautiful, never mind. But you have <laughs> Barnabas who, who sells a field that belongs to him. So he's a wealthy man. He owns property. He sells this field and he brings the money and he gives it to the church for the support of the poor, you know, to each according uh, to, to whoever, whoever had need. He donates it to a specific memorial and he wants a plaque on uh, the vase <laughs> that is purchased. And, and as you said, apologies to Bernie bros, but this is not making everybody socially equal, like economically middling, uh, this is more of the rich taking out of their abundance and giving what out of what they have uh, to to the poor. Right. And Barnabas is, is a fantastic example of that. The ones who yeah. are not such a great example of that are Ananias and Sapphira. Do you want to summarize them? Well, yeah, basically uh, Ananias and Sapphira. Well, actually, it's really it's short enough. We can we can go and just read it here. So this is the beginning of Acts chapter five. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain in your house? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed to gather to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. That's not one you trot out for stewardship Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, great fear came upon the whole church. Right. The great fear here, again, we might bristle at this. What do we do with this story here then? You don't lie to God. You don't withhold from God. Does that mean that you can't make a profit or run a business? No, that's not the point here. This was something of a virtue signal on their part. Barnabas sells the property and gives all of it. And Ananias and Sapphira try to mimic this charity, and yet what do they do? They make it more just an external show of charity when really they're just holding on to the greater part of it. Do you have anything to add that you would like to add there? No, I think that's, I think virtue signaling is a great way of putting it because it's not that, you know, not giving 100% is some, somehow means that you're going to get struck down when you give to the church today. What it means is that when you have this dissimulation, when you have this uh, hypocrisy, this act actively trying to make it seem like something that you're not, you are not just lying to men, you are lying to God. And so the, this is not what the church is supposed to be. We're not just virtue signaling about how great we are in the church or making it appear so. We are actually, you know, taking care of one another. We're actually showing love to one another. We're not just showing self-love. 
our charity should not be just mere window dressing or mere show. You show up and you drop some coins in the Salvation Army bucket around Christmas time and you say, hey, can you ring that bell a little bit louder, guy? That's not what we're talking about here. And and there's that slippery slope with charity. And there's the old Adam there. You know, we're supposed to do things out of love for neighbor, love for God. And very often there's that little there's that little bit in there of pride or vanity that just that just lingers. And Ananias and Sapphira are particularly egregious. And I think well, I don't think I know. I mean what what really takes people aback is that they're struck dead. Mm-hmm. Again, you don't want to lie to the Holy Spirit. You don't want to test the Spirit. If nothing else, because we will have to suffer a judgment. I mean, these things were done for our learning. Yes, God did use this particularly severe judgment here, but that doesn't mean that they did something really, really bad and deserved to be struck down, but rather that, you know, so that great fear would come upon the church, so that we would learn. Yeah, excellent point. I mean, this is this is this is the judgment coming in that right soon. This is the judgment coming here. This is what this is going to look like, folks. If you're going to test the Lord this way, this is going to happen to you at the day of judgment. And this and it's going to be that quick too. That's how quickly God strikes. You know, again, people are like, whoa, 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 but God is love and all that. And it's true. God is love. God is a God of mercy, but God is a holy God. God does judge. But this is how God has revealed himself. I mean, this is a this is a holy God. It's why our faith rests only in Jesus. Because if we're hoping that our you know, the good we've done or our cleverness or our hipness or our openness or whatever is going to please God. It's not. The only thing that's going to please God is going to be the merits won by the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not going to be simply talking about those merits or how well you've understood those merits and the mercy of God, you know, the the sacrifice of Jesus. It's going to be, are you covered by that blood? Are you washed? You know, have you been redeemed by the Redeemer? And have you laid hold of that? That's going to be the, that's going to be the important thing that matters because if not, we'll find ourselves all like Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah, I think you said it a little earlier that you know it's important to be clear in our preaching. This and this would be another perfect example of that. We also have to be clear in our preaching of God's of the coming judgment of the the wrath to come. Uh, because if we aren't, we aren't doing anybody any favors. Right. So to pick the pace up then, Ananias and Sapphira happens, fear grips the church, but many signs and wonders are done. Uh, what are some of the signs and wonders that occur after this? So we have the, the tongues thing, but then we have we have more. Yep. Here we have the, the healing of the sick, just as Jesus had done. Something even even more amazing, and maybe in, and also in fulfillment of Jesus' words, that you will see greater things than these. You, uh, the shadow of Peter heals some of, of the people, which yeah. I think is an amazing thing. He doesn't even need to lay hands. It's just the shadow cast upon them, does it? Again, these are confirming signs. These are to attest the validity of the message that these men are bringing. I think that's something that's a little bit difficult for us to understand because we think of the healings as the purpose in and of themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's not necessarily the case in the Bible. Every healing is an act of mercy, to be sure, but that's not necessarily the main reason for the gift of healing. Well, not even Jesus did healings just for the sake of healing. I mean, right, yes, right. he was, they, he was being there. merciful, um, but he was also using it to show that he is who he says that he is, yeah, that he is the son of God. Yeah, yeah, not just in Acts, but in the Gospels, you know, elsewhere. You know, very important, attesting signs. Now we've got chapter six, where the seven are chosen to serve the church, you know, to serve in, uh, well, how would you put the service of the seven? Well, um, the apostles are starting to realize that they need to spend more time in directly in preaching. And so I guess you could say the the church is having growing pains. Is that a good way to put it? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but basically they, they recognize that if they were going to start taking care of the widows all the time, that there would be no time left for preaching the word. And they recognize that both of these tasks were important. And so they pick, they choose the seven among whom is Stephen, who we're going to talk about a little bit more to, to carry out this task specifically. Uh, they're sometimes called deacons, but that's kind of a loaded word because it means a lot of different things in the modern church. 
not used in the text. True. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's always a proof. It's an interesting proof text because it doesn't actually use the word, but yeah. But it doesn't yeah. actually use the word, yeah. <laughs> and deacons are, um, yeah, you're, like you say, there are so many different you know, versions of a deacon from basically the transitional office you have you know, before entering the priesthood, although there are permanent deacons as well, to um, a guy who's basically a trustee, to the guy in the purple suit shaking hands and passing out flyers as you enter the church. I mean, you you see that word used um, uh, many different ways throughout world Christianity. That's exactly right. Well, maybe if we aren't using this as a proof text for deacons, because it doesn't actually say deacons, uh, what does this have to say about how the church should be set up, Willie? Well, I think a couple things to notice here that much as the apostles can't do everything, it's not necessary that the clergyman does everything. Now, hold on. That doesn't mean that people, that anybody should be administering the sacraments, anybody should be preaching, but can the layman serve the church by visiting the, the orphan and the widow or the sick and the infirm? Sure. Absolutely. But you do have something a little bit different. Yes. I mean, calling these men laymen is, prob- is, is is not my intention here either. What you also have, too, then, is, is an organization coming here and a choosing of men and a calling of men to this and putting them in this position, which is not insignificant. And then so the, the point here is that the, these men are receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so this isn't sure. just a purely voluntary kind of thing. But the question I guess you have to ask ourselves is, is this something meant only for the early church or is this something that continues into our own day? Well, yeah. And, and you know, that's that's part of my of my thinking here. You know, what's the general principle? Why, why are they called out for the sake of of service, service to the church? So, yeah, what do we do with that? Are these ought we to be ordaining men within the church as let's just say deacons, for lack of a better word, to carry out similar work? What do you think about that? Well, I think it certainly has precedent. I mean, I think you certainly have the the example of Stephen and the other six here uh, who have it. You have references also in the epistles to men who, uh, who are who are called to do other tasks as well. And so, I think if we are if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we we do want to say that Acts is at least describing something important here. That we can't just say, oh, what a, what a neat little historical relic. That's nice moving yeah, on. Yeah, and it's very clear, you know, and again, I don't want to confuse this with, with just laymen, but what has happened here is, is very significant. So 6 2, the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. So there's the primary function of the office, proclaiming the word of God. Therefore, brothers, Pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and, and of wisdom, whom we shall appoint to this duty. So these men, it couldn't just be random guys or guys who just, you know, kind of show up or they pull their names out of the head. It's seven men of good repute. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurius, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid hands on them. So you do have the laying on of hands here. And the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now that's just very interesting. So these men are actually called out and they receive the laying on of hands. So they are set apart for this particular task. Yeah, and so going back to, you know, this kind of thing we've been building up here, you know, what does it mean for the church today? Is there room for this today? You know, and that was sort of the point of my mentioning there is a place for the non-pastor to to step up and to do these works. Okay, so that's half of the argument. The second half then is it's not for them to take the work upon themselves. Right. Yeah, and so we can't – my argument kind of falls apart if we just – because I'm, I'm like a crazy non-denom on the one hand – if I'm over here, so then if I get, you know, so I got to, I got to flesh the whole thing out. It's not up to them to just, to just take it on, you know, oh, the Lord has put this on my heart. I will only serve the church by changing out light bulbs in odd numbered months, or I'll only serve the church by doing this or, or what have you. The church recognizes these men. They receive this, this charge. So there you have the organization of the church again, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not 
a God of disorder and chaos. This is, this is evident of evidence of the spirit working that these men are called out of good repute and decently and in order set about this task. And if we can't find something to imitate there, then I think maybe we should just close the book up because we're not getting it. <laughs> well, and, but it's, it's, it's not even just a matter of purely, you know, the practical end, like somebody's got to take care of the building because you right, have mentioned right. here Philip, who's later described, I'm, I'm convinced, is the same one who's described as an evangelist. Mm-hmm. So he, he is holding an ordained office of some kind. Yeah. But, and you do have that understanding of deacon very, very early in church history, that it is that not quite a priest, right? But mm-hmm. but an office to which a man is ordained to, to do this. I do think, really, we can go to, to any different extreme here. But yeah, like you said, with Philip, he is preaching. And then with these men in six, if we just, for the sake of argument, concede the point that they're deacons, then they're purely dedicated to mercy work, for lack of a better word. Yeah, so it's very interesting, the history of the deacons. Hey, maybe we'll do a podcast on that in the future. I don't know. <laughs> Always in the future. <laughs> right. Always in the future. Always looking forward. We're forward-thinking people here, if the Lord wills it. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, folks, we're going to take another break. We'll be right back with more Word Fitly Spoken. We'll be back in just a few moments. A Word Fitly Spoken proclaims Jesus Christ in all His fullness from in-depth exploration of Holy Scripture and study of how God's Word has borne fruit throughout church history. Come along with us at wordfitlyspoken.org, facebook.com slash wordfitly, or on Twitter at wordfitly. This is a word fitly spoken. Willie Grill, Zelwyn Heine, back again, talking about Acts of the Apostles. We've just finished up a fun discussion about Ananias and Sapphira and a mild debate concerning the nature of deacons. Now we move on into one of the most stirring stories, that it will be the martyrdom of St. Stephen. So St. Stephen is filled with the Spirit and doing many signs and wonders. And then what happens, Zelwyn? Well, then he incurs the wrath of the Jews again, who basically tell him to stop, but he then proclaims a very powerful sermon showing how that they have always been, in his words, a stiff-necked people. And after he gets done preaching this very powerful sermon, and we can break it down however you want, Willie, they stone him, and he becomes the first Christian martyr, and we remember him for that. So first things first, let's define a martyr. Um, Martyr literally means witness, and so it has it's someone who dies as a way of bearing witness to the truth. It's not just someone who just dies how do you want to say it? they not just be they're not not just killed but killed specifically because they are a Christian and in doing so bring glory to God. Any Christian who is murdered is not necessarily a martyr it, It's a pretty narrow parameter for what it means to be a martyr you know when we use that term all the time, it's like well. A celebrity became a martyr, so he lost an endorsement or something like that. He was martyred for his, you know, controversial comments or something like that. (laughs) You know, as time goes on, it just gets so watered down. Or any Christian who suffers an injustice is a martyr, or any Christian. And that's just not the case. And when we we cheapen that, we really cheapen that witness. When we cheapen the word, we, we cheapen what these brave people went through. You know, confessing the truth of the faith in the face of death. And and really that's a that's a confidence that comes only in a sure hope of the resurrection. Yeah, and Stephen himself is is said to see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. The Jews are so enraged because of that, that's when they actually kill him. So yes, it's absolutely because he is giving witness to the hope within him that he is killed, not just because he happened to get murdered. Yeah. And without getting too detailed into the sermon, it is a sermon that goes through the history of that people, of his people, and shows them how time and time again, God has extended his hand of mercy and God has made these explicit promises and they have turned away from their God. And ultimately that culminates in the death of Jesus Christ. 
which ironically is the victory over sin, death, and the devil. It's another, you know, back to our discussion of providence, you know, it's another example of you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. But his sermon is so bold and so striking and so faithful that it enrages the crowd and they execute him. And what form did they choose? Uh, They stoned him to death, which would be, I believe, the punishment reserved for blasphemers, isn't it? Yeah, and it's and it's you know it's one of the most brutal ways that you can kill a person. It's not quick, and it's certainly not painless. And the thing about stoning is everybody takes part in that. You know, everybody's picking up, everybody's participating in that execution. So just heaping heaping condemnation on themselves. I think we should take this to heart, though, too, because even if we do have to suffer tremendous persecution, even if we ourselves become martyrs, we know that Stephen was immediately received into heaven, and we will also be with Jesus. I mean, so I think it's it's a reassurance, not, oh, look what, you know, poor, poor Stephen, but a, a recognition that, yes, even though we have to suffer the, the hostility of the world, even unto death, uh, Jesus is still with us. Yeah, absolutely. And and that hope is there, that they can take your very life, but that's as far as they can go. And that God is the one who, above all, we should love and fear. It's an interesting thing, martyrdom. Martyrdom is not something that one should seek, you know, sort of suicide by persecution. You don't find martyrdom, or you don't seek martyrdom. Martyrdom finds you. And that's the pattern set forth in the scriptures. It's a pattern that continues. Martyrdoms are not unique to Acts and not unique to the Scriptures, but still very much happening in parts of the world today, particularly the Global South, where it's kind of funny. For all of our talk that we hear about the great growth that Christianity makes in these parts, we don't talk about the great persecution that Christianity faces. It's quite often the case that Christianity flourishes in times of persecution. But we've kind of like set up like certain parts of the world or or certain parts of the world throughout history as somehow just just these magical places where the faith just grew and and flourished and then the world was perfect. And it's not. The world persecutes the church today just as it did in the beginning. And there are martyrs today. But what is the hope there? That just as Stephen was martyred and received into the kingdom, so too are these martyrs received into the kingdom. And so too will these people who kill and slaughter Christians, so too will they, apart from repentance and faith, so too will they experience the condemnation of those in the scriptures who persecuted the people of God and did not repent. So you do have these two things going on. You have the terrible persecution of the church, yes, just as you have in parts of the world today, but you also have the vindication of the church, both immediately by being received into the kingdom, the heavenly kingdom, and then later at the day of judgment, when all wrong committed to Christians will be righted. And every bit of ridicule, not just extreme cases like martyrdom, but even milder forms of persecution like ridicule, okay, or losing your business or something like that, all of that will be made right at the end of days. And in the meantime, those who sleep in Christ are with Christ in paradise. And there's your hope there. I mean, there, there's strength, strength that can only come from the Holy Spirit. But there is that hope, that sure and unshakable hope in the face of the persecution that Christ Jesus will receive you into his kingdom. Yeah, we have, and we see that very clearly here, like like you say. And maybe, maybe but also something to emphasize here, too, is as we, we begin to meet a, an important figure in the book of yes. Acts. Yes, so this very important little footnote here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, what, so what happens here? So, as Stephen dies, they take his they say they take his cloak and they lay it at the feet of a young man named Saul. And this Saul is one uh, that we know better as Paul, who initially was a persecutor of the church, and he is the one who begins a tremendous persecution of the church that will actually cause the church to be scattered outside of Jerusalem. Yeah, Paul is, or Saul is just a, um, and we'll get more into him uh, later, of course, but just a a tremendously violent persecutor of the church. The Mm -hmm. last person we would expect to be, you know, the most prolific author of the New Testament, for example, or Mm -hmm. the whole Bible, really. 
you know, you know, if you're, if you're looking at both testaments, he's got more books and they're all in one testament. So he was, Paul's what we call high energy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then there's that hope for those out there today who are persecuting the church. That is the message for you. It's the message for Saul. It was the message for Saul. Now, Paul, that cease this wickedness that you're doing and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we recognize that only the Holy Spirit can do that. And But not everybody's going to have as dramatic conversion experience as Saul. But before we get into that, the message here is this. As wicked as Paul was, he was not beyond redemption. Christ died for him the same. And his sins were forgiven. But it's also worth pointing out here, too, that, you know, again, talking about providence, Saul is going to be converted, but his persecution right now is used to great benefit because it causes Philip, among other people, to actually leave Jerusalem. Yes, yes. It, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's just like the cross, just like Joseph and his brothers. The evil that men do, you know, God works good through it. God means it for good. It, it's tremendous. As, as much persecution they can throw at the church, God is, is, is turning that into the greatest expansion the church has seen. Yeah, so I think, I think there's a, also a lesson in that, too, that even in the times of the great persecution, God has allowed this to, to come upon us for a, for a reason. It's not just, uh, oh, the, uh, this is happening and it's outside of, this is just happening to us, you know, how are we ever going to get through it? But rather, God is actually using this to, to the benefit of the church. And, and, and we'll get into Philip here a little bit more, but where do you want to go with this right now? Yeah, let's 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 go right into Philip because we have Saul persecuting the church, and then we have Philip in Samaria. Okay, so so Philip, one of the seven, goes out into the wilderness. He's going out towards Samaria, and he's actually beginning to preach, and he's doing many signs. And so he's actually going outside of Jerusalem to do this. And most notably, at the end of chapter eight, he meets a a, a eunuch from Ethiopia. Someone who's probably a God fearer, but probably not a Jew, and he actually proclaims that that word to him, and so we already start to see here the going out of the gospel into all the world, and this is happening even in the midst of a, a tremendous persecution. So God is working through Philip to bring about faith, even in the most unlikely of places. Yeah, interesting. You know, the, the, I mean, the Ethiopian eunuch. So much to unpack there. You know, Philip working. We got this interesting story of Simon the magician that happens mm -hmm. um, between Philip going to Samaria and the Ethiopian. Why is Simon significant for us? Simon's significant because Simon tries to get the power of God for himself using money, yeah. and that's why we often call it simony or simony or however you want to pronounce it. Um, right. This idea that we can buy the things of God. No, the, God is not for sale. The, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not for sale. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are a free gift for for everyone. And so Simon, in that way, is showing us that, yes, God is not looking for power or he's not looking for money. He's looking to proclaim the gospel. And so I think the two are are very closely tied together for that reason. You know, it's come in our day, you know, simony, which is where quite literally you would bribe someone for a church office or a church role. And that speaks to the pattern that we see in Acts. It is God who calls and the church who ratifies. So, you know, God in his providence is going to raise up his servants, but the church is the one who ordains them for this specific task. And the church does not say, hey, if you give me X amount of money, we'll ordain you to, to whatever role you want. And you certainly don't go to the church and say, hey, I'll throw some shekels your way if you give me, you know, this title and this role. That has been a problem throughout church history. A graft, you know, is just a big a problem in, in uh, the church as it is in the labor union or wherever. And we need to be careful with that. And especially those of us who occupy the office. First, we are all in the office by the grace of God. Okay, God has put us here. We don't. The bigger point is, is that the office is not an entitlement. It's not something that you demand or can demand or that you can buy. What, what would you say there, Z? No, I mean, you're right. I mean, and so Simon is trying to, to buy his way into the kingdom, to buy his way into the office, so to speak. And no, it's not something that can be bought for money. And you know, you, you made an egregious error when your sin was so unique and bad that they named it after you. 
He, it's the Lou Gehrig's <laughs> disease of sin. <laughs> to, to Simon's credit, he does repent. Yes, but and that's the worst of, part. It's kind of like, like doubting Thomas, right? Yeah, <laughs> you ask one question, and for the rest of history, you're doubting. You're doubting Thomas. <laughs> but but yes, yeah, so he does repent of this particular sin. But again, I mean, I think it just teaches us the importance of remembering that no, this is not ours. This is God's, and God will do with it as He pleases. And then, just as Philip proclaims the gospel to this Ethiopian. It's not Philip's gospel, it's not Philip's preaching, but the Holy Spirit that's doing it. And right. that's bo- both of these are teaching us. So the next major event then is going to be the conversion of Saul. This is a very famous, I mean, countless works of art, countless sermons, and really everybody's been trying to one-up this conversion story since it happened, because it is so <laughs> spectacular. So if you don't mind, go ahead and give us a quick rundown of the conversion of Saul. So Saul is trying to go to Damascus to continue his persecution. And as he's going along the road there, at some point on the road, he sees a bright light. And he's blinded and he falls off of his horse. And and he hears the voice of Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so Saul, even though he never saw Jesus while Jesus was, you know, walking around on earth, then then becomes a witness of the resurrected Christ because Christ himself reveals himself to to him and so and then after this uh, Saul becomes blind and is told to go to Ananias who will pray for him to remove his blindness and because of the result of all of this he's converted in a very powerful way and the great persecutor of the church becomes perhaps the well, I'm almost even the greatest apostle. I mean, right. I know, I don't, I know, I don't know if you can say greatest, <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? Right. Yeah, he's converted. You know, it's an interesting thing. You know, he he he's converted and then receives some training, and then really comes back and really picks up his ministry in earnest, which is significant. It's not as if he just immediately begins to do stuff after he falls off the horse. I mean, he can't mm-hmm. because he's blind, but. Um, <laughs> you know, and I guess immediately he does actually proclaim Jesus in the synagogue. But then there's also a difference between him proclaiming Jesus immediately because, you know, he actually saw the risen Christ and the guy who says, you know, I I feel like I have a call and so I'm going to go take over a pulpit. <laughs> right, right. And and it is interesting to have a conversion experience so significant your name changes. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, this is this is different than a guy just sort of step setting up his own shop. And he does, you know, he he is not divorced from the rest of the church. There are conflicts and headbutting, but he is not divorced from like the church of Jerusalem, for example, or even from Peter despite despite the conflicts. Although there is a rather permanent separating of ways, you know, with other people. But that's not really quite the same thing as as forming his own sect separate from the church at large. Which is going to be the accusation, you know, I think that some are going to be throwing at him. And and some would be modern historians want to say that too. Anyway, Mm -hmm. so we got that. And then chapter 10, we come to Peter and Cornelius. And we want to kind of end on this because it's important. So I guess my next question is, Zelwyn, are you a Gentile? A Gentile of Gentiles. Yeah, I know. My people, my people weren't even converted until the Middle Ages. So let's let's just put that out there. Right. So this is going to be significant for us because now we're going to get into Gentile missions. I mean, really, it's going to start to ramp up here. Mm-hmm. The majority of the church is not Jewish. I think we. I don't think anybody's going to argue us on that point. And the purpose of the church from the beginning was to go into all the world. Mm-hmm. Okay, and we, yep. we're, we're, we're seeing it happen here. Now, you have examples all throughout world history of people, you know, coming into joining God's people. But this is, this is very different and very significant. Mm-hmm. This is the Holy Ghost going out and illumining people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. So it is significant that the church ultimately becomes a, a Gentile-dominated entity. And I don't think unexpected, because it's one tree still, right? To follow St. Paul, it's still the, still the one tree, and the Gentiles are grafted in. Not to say they're illegitimate, it's to say that they are now part of the people of God. 
the one people of God, the one church. So yeah, Peter and Cornelius, they'll and take it away. Well, I'll, I'll just, just briefly, I mean, Cornelius is a God-fearer. He's a Gentile. He's part of the Italian cohort, so he's a Roman soldier. And he's praying, and he receives a a message saying, you know, send for Peter. Go go find this Peter who's at this place and bring him to you. And Peter also receives a vision that he doesn't quite understand at first of this uh, food being taken up into heaven, but he then comes to realize what God means by it is that he should not regard as unclean what God has declared to be clean, by which God means the Gentiles are just as much a part of the church as any Jew. No, no, no. This is the proof text for why we can stuff our face with anything. Right? <laughs> yeah, because then that makes total sense later, too, in Acts, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Stay away from, stay away stay from, away from, from food that's been strangled. Yeah, stay away from these things. But no, 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 the vision. It, it always is funny. People... Like the the point the point of Peter's vision is the conversion of the world and not a BLT. <laughs> not that, not that, as the Bible says, a man is not made unclean by what he eats. That's absolutely true, but we can't be trotting mm-hmm. this out as a proof text when it's not a proof text. Uh, we have to use it as a proof text for what it's actually a proof text for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you're if you're going to prove something, you have to use real proof, uh, uh. and so. So yeah, eat, eat what you want in moderation. Just don't trot this text out because the text is about the universality of the gospel and God uh, cleansing, you know, making all men clean who would believe. So sorry, but Cornelius. Yep, no, and that's fine. And so Peter does come and then Cornelius receives the gospel in great earnestness. During that time, there's a visible outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles. Uh, that's actually important because it's very distinct from Pentecost. If you remember from Pentecost, it was Jews from every nation under heaven who were at Pentecost. There were no Gentiles there. But now we have almost, you could say, almost a second Pentecost of sorts. I, I know that's kind of a, a weird way of saying it, but basically you have another outpouring of the Spirit that says that, yes, even the Gentiles are part of the church. Well, yeah, and it's not, I mean, it's not far-fetched to say, because it's Acts 10, 44. While Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were, were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And we're assuming, again here, rightly, that it's it's known languages, you know, languages mm-hmm. of the world. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they asked him to remain for some days. And that's another weird thing that we kind of get. I mean, beautiful picture here, and they've received the Holy Spirit, and it's like, who's going to, why wouldn't you baptize these people? Let's do it. Mm -hmm. But Acts is a bit difficult when it comes to the receiving of the Holy Spirit, because you have several different receivings of the Holy Spirit. And that causes us to trip up a lot. So we want to, you know, some not we, but uh, certain people want to sometimes divorce reception of the Holy Spirit from baptism or water baptism uh, because of texts like these. Coming to the end of the broadcast, I hurl a biblical difficulty at us. But what do we do with that, with these different, rece- you know, these different receptions of the Holy Spirit here? I think we just have to see them for what they are. And that is a confirmation of the message of the apostles. So that once the Holy Spirit has been poured out in a way and to show Peter that the, that the Holy Spirit is also going out to the Gentiles, we don't need a super extraordinary pouring outs of the Spirit again. The Spirit has done his work. He has confirmed the message. And now we know and we can take confidence knowing that when we do things like baptizing, when we do things like preaching, that the Holy Spirit is also there. I mean, he could give us more signs if he wanted to. He's certainly he's God. He can do whatever he wants. But he's given us this sign to Cornelius and to the Gentiles with Cornelius as a way of showing that, yes, this is the way you are supposed to go. And Here so go. go do what I'm sending you to do. Great stuff. Any final words before we wrap it up? I wish we could go on more in Acts, and maybe we will in, in the future. But again, I think it's a, a great way of emphasizing that, yes, all of this is meant for our comfort. It's not just history, but it is the Word of God, which is instructive and which builds up unto life everlasting. Amen. 
This has been a Word Fitly Spoken. If you like what you heard, check us out, wordfitlyspoken.org, facebook.com slash wordfitly, or Twitter at wordfitly. We also have a new discussion group online, if you want to check that out, at Word Fitly Posting group for listeners to discuss our topics and future topics and things like that. That's Word Fitly posting on Facebook. God love you. God bless. This has been a Word Fitly Spoken.